Now Habersham is proud to sponsor interviews with the candidates for the May 24th political primaries. We hope by viewing these personal interviews, you'll get to know the candidates who will be making decisions that impact your life, your family, and your livelihood here at the local and state level in Georgia. We hope you'll vote May 24th, and we hope you'll be more informed in that process by hearing from the candidates themselves in these one-on-one -on -one interviews sponsored by Now Habersham. Hi, this is Now Habersham, and we're speaking today with Paul Brown, a candidate for the U.S. Congressional 9th District. And welcome, uh, Paul, to Now Habersham. Nice to be here. We'd like to visit with you. So tell us a little bit about your formal education that might prepare you, and I know you've, you've held office before, but might prepare you for the 9th District. Well, I'm a medical doctor, and one of the biggest issues we face as a nation is Obamacare. We've got to rip it out by the roots. When I was in Congress, representing Habersham County, by the way, I uh, introduced my Patient Option Act, it was H.R. 2900 in the 113th Congress. People can go on thomas.gov and can read the bill. It's the only Republican bill that allows patients to make health care decisions along with their doctor without some federal bureaucrat being in the middle of that decision process. All the other Republican bills, in fact, continue to have the federal government to dictate health care policy, and that's a big part of the reason that healthcare is so expensive. I'm a small businessman. I've been involved in small business. My dad was a Firestone dealer. I grew up uh, in retail. I managed to uh, help manage a filling station when I was in college to help work my way through school. But we've got to restore fiscal sanity. We've got to go back to the foundational principles that made this country great. I'm an original intent constitutionalist. In fact, I carry a copy in my pocket. And the, the thing is, uh, we have left this as the governing force of our nation. In fact, our current congressman told people here in Habersham County, I just ran into a lady he, at the GOP uh, convention up in Rabin County just two weeks ago, a lady from Habersham County and another one independently out of Madison County told me that Doug Collins, our current congressman, promised them that they would vote just like Paul Brown votes. He's promised people all over the 9th Congressional District that he would be an original intent constitutionalist. He's not been, that's not true. And uh, he's the best example of how he is out of touch with the people of this district, state, as well as the nation, is the omnibus bill that he voted for. It funds Planned Parenthood. He denies that, but it does. In fact, Franklin Graham quit the GOP over that one bill and one vote. It funds Planned Parenthood. In fact, the Huffington Post in their article about the omnibus bill in the headlines, big win for Planned Parenthood. It also funds Obamacare, totally. The Republicans made no effort to try to stop Obamacare. They made no effort to try to stop any of Obama's uh, bad policies. It funds the Syrian refugee program and the and multitude of, of the president's amnesty program. It funds Common Core. He's going around saying he's against Common Core, but that funded it totally. And in fact, there was another bill called the Every Student Succeeds Act that Doug Collins voted for that uh, authorized Common Core and No Child Left Behind. I call that No Teacher Left Unshackled. We've got to get the shackles off teachers and let them teach. And in fact, I introduced a bill that would totally eliminate the Department of Education. It's hard to write because they have their tentacles into a whole lot of things, but I want to get rid of the Department of Education. I want to get rid of the Department of Commerce. I want to get rid of the Department of Labor. Let's get rid of the Department of Energy. While we're at it, let's get rid of the EPA also, and the IRS too. Those are the kind of positive solutions that I'll offer, not to represent the, the establishment in Washington, D.C., like Doug Collins does, but to represent the people of this district. Let's get this country going again, create jobs. My Jobs Act would bring millions of new jobs here, not only to Habersham County and to Georgia, but all over this country, bring manufacturing back here. Those are the kind of positive solutions that I've offered, and my background helps support all that. Absolutely. Let me go back to something you just said. Right. Um, I'm a professor of uh, communications and journalism at Georgia right. State, and since it's the Southeast's largest university now, uh, having joined hands with Georgia Perimeter College, 
Uh, my classes tend to be large. Uh -huh. I have 120 students in my classes that I teach. And uh, not too long ago, we were talking about in our media class, the Obama health care bill or the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. The Unaffordable Uncaring Act, that's what I call it. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you made, you made clear your uh -huh. position, but let me tell you quickly a vote that was taken class, and let me ask you as a physician sure. and also as a, a former legislature what you feel about this. We had... Um, we did a monkey survey, if you're familiar with monkey survey, where kids can quickly use their phone to do survey. Immediately we see the answers up on the, right. a large screen. And we talked, we asked them about how many of them had health care uh, insurance and how many of them um, were covered with health care, how many of them were not covered with health care. It was a survey of, a, of 10 questions. And out of the 120, uh, 80 of them, about 60%, um, only had health care because of the Affordable Care Act. Before that, they had no health care because they were deleted from their parents' policies at that point. The Affordable Health Care Act has helped college students and even a short time after college, up to six months. What would you do, first of all, as a physician, for losing the health care that we now have for those people and the 11 million other people who have now, some of them paying into the system, some of them needing assistance to get health care, how would you reconcile the taking away if you, as you use your own words, ripping it out? Well, there are 26 million people in this country that don't have any health insurance. Right. Everybody has health care in this country. We're talking about two different things. Health insurance is one thing. Health care is another. And in fact, the hospital here in Habersham County is being overburdened by people coming in that don't have health insurance, using the emergency room as a primary care facility. You have illegal aliens all over this country that are flooding into our emergency rooms. And we have a situation over in, in LJ, in, in Gilmer County, where they have recently closed their emergency room because they can't afford to keep it open anymore. And that hospital very likely is going to go out of business because of the federal government, because of Obamacare. And not only because of Obamacare, but because of the policy set forth by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We call it CMS. The solution is let's get it so that everybody has good, affordable insurance so that the kids can afford to buy insurance so that their parents can afford to buy it for them. Obamacare is not the solution. It's made everybody's health insurance skyrocket. Why? Because of the government being involved in it. Let's open up health insurance purchases across state lines. Let's, uh, let's give people a tax credit for buying health insurance, which is an innovative piece of my legislation, the Patient Option Act. Let's give doctors a tax credit for seeing indigent patients, which is a very innovative thing that's in my bill. None of the other Republican bills have these innovative things in them. My Patient Option Act will make good quality health care, not health insurance necessarily, but health care, available for all Americans, and it will make health insurance and all health care expenses much less expensive for everybody so people can afford to buy health insurance. And those kids that you're talking about can afford to buy health insurance. I'm uh, 65 okay. and I still work for Young fellow. Thank you. <laughs> and I, uh, but believe it or not, I still have a student loan. <laughs> uh, oh my, I, my parents and I ch uh, paid for bachelor's degree and master's, but I had to fund the PhD from right. Texas Tech University. It, it was $45,000, and so I'm still paying for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the interest rate recently uh, went up as well. So uh, I'm trying to get it paid off so I can retire. My, uh, two of my sons both have student loans. One of them is an attorney who went to John Marshall, and his student loan is in the neighborhood of $100,000. Right. So uh, I, I, I've heard you speak about some of these issues before, but has education gotten out of hand and the cost of education? The cost we, has, yes. So absolutely. what do we do about that? I mean, only certain families can actually afford to pay up front $125,000 right. for a bachelor's degree. What we do is get rid of the Department of Education. The federal government funding education is a big part of the problem because they put a lot of, of red tape to all their funding. Uh, the, the other thing is the federal government's taken over the student loan program and, and it's the, the cost of education, the cost of student loans have all skyrocketed. Just like healthcare costs have skyrocketed, it's because the federal government is, is dictating policy and is 
uh, mucking up the free market system. The free market system guarantees the highest quality of all goods and services, whether it's healthcare or student loans or education or anything else. It, it ensures the highest quality. It ensures the best prices because of competition and it ensures the best quantity of all those goods and services. So we've got to get the tax burden and regulatory burden off of not only higher education, but all education so that we can lower the cost so students can afford to go to college, can afford to go to technical colleges. In 2001, uh, Orrin Hatch, uh, the Republican senator from Utah, co-sponsored the DREAM Act. It passed the House, but it failed in the Senate. And then uh, the DREAM Act was brought up again about uh, four or five years ago. It passed the Senate, but it failed in the House. Uh, so I would like to ask you a question about that. Uh, I know you have very strong feelings about illegal immigrants, and rightfully so. I don't think there's anybody in this country who thinks it's okay for people just to come in to any country, United States or any country, unbridled uh, illegally. There's just not any Republican or any Democrat that thinks that's okay that I know of anyway. But the fact of the matter is, we do have people here, and most of those people are gainfully employed, and let's take a look at Habersham County. Our poultry industry here in Habersham County and the surrounding counties, if they didn't have Hispanic hands in those companies, would cease to function and operate. Now, most of those people are here uh, legally, if you were to go through there and they have immigration, you'll see that almost all of them are here on a work visa, but not all of them. How do we rectify the situation in America, which I know you're strongly, uh, I know you have strong feelings about illegal immigration. How do we rectify the situation short of doing what one presidential candidate said was send 11 people, many, many people home? Is there a way for the Republicans and the Democrats, if you're elected to Congress, to come together and come up with an immigration bill that both parties can agree upon and make sense out of counties like Habersham and Hall County, by the way, that relies tremendously on Hispanic labor? What are your thoughts about that? Could we come up with a bill? Until we secure the border, nothing else matters. All this discussion is is totally moot, uh, moot point until we secure the border. I want to secure the border today. Let's go put the troops, bring them from places all over the world where they don't need to be. Let's put them on the border, the northern border as well as the southern border. It is a national security issue. When I was in Congress, I was on the Homeland Security Committee. We've got people coming across, particularly the southern border, that are described as OTMs other than Mexicans. Some of those are from Central and South America, but we have a bunch of people coming in from the Middle East. We have a bunch of people coming in from Asia. We have a lot of people of Muslim backgrounds, a lot of young people that of, of age that would be typical of the radical Muslim uh, that want to destroy America. We must secure the border first and foremost, and I want to, whoever our next president is, and I'll, as a congressman, do everything I can to get the border secured immediately. Then we have to start enforcing the laws that are on the books. We've had four presidents, two Republicans, George Herbert Walker Bush, George W. Bush, then Bill Clinton, and now Barack Obama, that have refused to uphold the laws that are on the books. You talk about their illegal immigrants. They're not immigrants, they're aliens. They're here illegally. They've broken not only the the laws about coming into this country illegally, but they've also broken many other laws. Virtually all of them have uh, social security cards that are fraudulent. They have other documents. They are living here fraudulently. We've got to start enforcing the law. I believe in the rule of law where everybody is subject to the same laws and should be treated equally under the law, whether it's the President of the United States all the way down to us regular folks. No one is above the law, and I'll do everything I can to make sure that the law is applied equally and appropriately. Once we start doing that, then we, and, and I think we ought to have a halt of legal immigration because the legal immigration system is totally broken. You're talking about these uh, workers. We already have a, a mechanism to get workers here, but we're not giving the employers the tools that they need to know whether an employee is legal or not. 
because they all have fraudulent documents. Paul Brown, great Thank to you have so you much. today on Now Habersham. Appreciate it. This is Now Habersham, and today we're speaking with Roger Fitzpatrick, a candidate for U.S. Congressional District Number 9. Roger, welcome to Now Habersham. Thank you for having me. All righty. Let's uh, begin by talking a little bit about your formal education. Tell us a little about a classroom, that sort of thing uh, that you've earned or uh, programs you've been certified in that lead you to be qualified to be the ninth Congressional District uh, Representative? Well, I've got a bachelor's in science and education from the University of Georgia. I have a master's in education from North Georgia College and then a specialist in education from the University of Georgia. Taught in the classroom for 14 years and went into administration and uh, retired in 2012 from the White County School System as an elementary school principal. And then since then, I'm working part-time with Mountain Education Charter High School as a site, ad site administrator uh, here in Habersham County. And then I also teach three days a week at a homeschool academy in, uh, in Gainesville. Great. What about informal uh, education experiences, so, some of the jobs you just mentioned? What, what have you learned from some of those that might make you a great uh, congressman? Well, the, the main thing that I've learned from my career in education is you, you have to learn how to work with people. And uh, I'd, I'd say that's the main thing that would carry over into working with Congress. Uh, you know, we are all Americans and we need to work together to be able to solve the problems that are facing this country. But, but another thing is that uh, when you look at the writings of the founders, uh, they were citizen servants. Very few of them had actual formal political training. Uh, what they had was an understanding of the way that government is supposed to function, and they understood that you had to be a servant first instead of just somebody that wanted to have a political career. And, and the, the advent of the career politician was, uh, didn't come about until the, the, really the middle part of the last century. Up until that point, you had people that would go into Congress for the most part. There were exceptions, of course, but you had people that would go into Congress and they would serve a couple of terms and then they would go home and then they'd let somebody else come in and, and do the job. So, so my understanding of the way that government works is more through an informal training of studying the Constitution, studying our founders, trying to understand the way that uh, this Republican form of government is supposed to work. And uh, that was more of just studying on my own rather than taking formal classes. I see. Okay, let's talk about an issue. Okay. <laughs> Let me preface it a little bit with a backstory. I have a son who lives in upstate New York, is mm -hmm. an attorney in Poughkeepsie. And uh, the power company in upstate New York is, has been for about three or four years now very interested in individual families uh, purchasing, securing, leasing solar panels mm -hmm. uh, on their property mm -hmm. uh, for two things, uh, to create a cleaner environment for the state of uh, New York and also uh, to reduce the power consumption generally overall uh, in that part of that state. Uh, so he went through the process and did this and is now not only completely paying his electric bill every month by having solar energy, but he's also getting a check back, not a lot, because mm -hmm. he's mm -hmm. limited. I think he gets right. $100 back. But well, he generates, $100. And, 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 but he has no power bill. So, right. so um, as a college professor and the kind of person who drives a Prius <laughs> and is interested mm -hmm. in this, uh, a few days ago I started to investigate this and also teaching in Atlanta journalism and covering issues like this with my classes. Um, um, the power generator companies typically in Georgia have not been very much embracing this particular issue. I did notice this last week that the power company that services my house, HEMC, mm -hmm right on the front page now has an opportunity for us to buy into production of solar energy off-site for a price and then getting back those funds credit to our bill mm -hmm. which would probably exceed the amount that we actually buy the panel for. So we're buying pan leasing panels elsewhere. Right. Which I think is a great first step because anybody can do this. You don't have to have the panels in your house. Right. So as a congressman and particularly congressman in a state that has it um, a, cuddled up to solar power by residents. What do you think about uh, generating energy in Georgia uh, this way as opposed to building extremely expensive power facilities right. of which are extraordinarily controversial? I think that we need to explore, and, and when, I say, when I say we, I think that it's the private enterprise, not government, mm -hmm. because government does not need to be in to uh, that, that segment of, of the industry. 
Uh, but when you have private companies that work with individuals to be able to solve a problem like we have, like the, the energy situation that we have, I, I am all for that. Free enterprise always works best. So you have companies that are working to provide solar power through the, the way that HMC is trying to do it, or, or even better, the way that the, the power company in New York is doing, but it's not government involvement right. in that. So, so many times, and especially in the past seven plus years, what we've seen is government has been picking winners and losers in the, the, the right. green energy yeah. system and how many millions and millions and I would even say billions of dollars has the government given to green energy companies mm -hmm. who have since gone bankrupt sure. and so that's just money down the drain mm -hmm. padding somebody's pockets but it's, uh, it's something that the federal government should not be involved yeah. in. So you're not interested in Congress forcing no, say sir. Georgia Power I to have not. a program. No sir. But you are maybe endorsing the notion that people should be able to generate this electricity. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think and even if, sell back some of it. Absolutely. I think that uh, when, when you have individuals working with the private enterprise, free enterprise system, that's the way it's going to work best. Mm -hmm. and, and, and two things always happen when you have competition. The quality of the product goes up and the price goes down. Yeah. And so if we leave this alone and let the, the, the companies, because there's a market out there for clean energy. There absolutely there is. But government does not be, need to be involved in it through regulation or picking winners and losers by giving uh, funds to these companies. In 2001, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch from uh, Utah co-sponsored uh, the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act it was a program uh, to help children of undocumented, if we want to say illegal aliens, that's fine. Uh, those children who were brought here, sometimes as young as a, a, a year old or even younger, or in elementary school, who would not have a choice in their action. In other words, they couldn't say, I'm not going to violate the law and come with you, parent. Right. Uh, they're brought here really against their, the notion of what might be right or wrong. Uh, so, and these kids have sort of grown up here, and this is all the culture they know. Some of them don't even speak their native language um, very well. Uh, so the DREAM Act was a way to help these kids sort of get situated, be a part of the culture, and to go to school. That was passed by the House, overwhelmingly bipartisan, and then it did not pass the Senate right. in 2001. Uh, eight years later, flip-flop, it was sponsored by the same exact bill, it was sponsored by the, in the Senate and passed, a bipartisan vote, but it was uh, not, it, it received a majority of votes in the House, but not enough to overcome a filibuster, so it, uh, it died as well. Um, and these were, again, were Republican-sponsored bills. Um, w in the county here in the area that you would represent, we have a tremendous number of Hispanics who, if they walked out the door tomorrow, would leave industries like uh, the chicken industry in chaos. There's, there's not the numbers of people just to come in here and take up those jobs. The same thing with agriculture, apples, uh, peanuts, onions, that sort of thing. In fact, we lost our Hispanic workers. They've skipped the state, and the prisoners had to pull the onions out of the ground for one day and said they would never do it again. I think most Republicans and most Democrats would like to see America to sit down at the table and solve the problem and not say, we'll solve the problem when we build a wall. I think people want the problem solved. Uh, and so what are your thoughts about that? If you look at the whole issue of immigration, you know, we've, we've got to have an immigration program. Right. Uh, because this country is really a, a country of immigrants. But, but one thing you have to look at is, is that we have a culture. And it is a culture of, of, of freedom, of liberty, of the, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, we, we have a standard of the way that people are supposed to conduct themselves in this country. And many times what's happened is, is you have people that come into this country and they want to bring their own culture, which is many times in conflict with the culture of America. So we need to make sure that we have uh, enforce the laws that are already on the books. Now we have so many people that are coming into this country illegally across the borders and, and it's really wrecking chaos in the way that, uh, that, that things are going. And we have, uh, at, at a low ball estimate, of, of 12 million people that are here illegally. And so we need to make sure that we, uh, that people obey the law. Because see, th this is a country that, it, it, that operates according to the rule of law. And any time that we just set aside that rule of law for the convenience of a segment of, of, of the country, 
then what we're doing is we are creating chaos in the country. We have to obey the law. Now, uh, one reason that many people come into this country illegally is because they know that they can get benefits by coming into the country. And one way to solve that problem apart from building a wall, which I'm in favor of, we need to secure our borders because it is a national security issue. But one way that we can also solve that problem is by eliminating any benefits that an illegal alien would receive. And, and uh, just to kind of segue in to the, the omnibus bill that was passed in, in December of last year, there are tax credits for illegal aliens. And they receive something yes, based on this. They get child tax credit. They, they do. Or they file their income tax. Yes. And, and so there are many benefits that are available. There, there's illegal, illegal alien uh, resettlement benefits that, that also go along with this. And so if we remove those benefits, which are things that are not available to us, the ones that are citizens of the United States, then that would solve many of those types of things. Now. That's the big problem that we have. Now, when you get into the local kind of issues, well, like what, what's gonna to happen to the poultry industry in, in Habersham County? I think that there is a way, uh, a child that was you know, 30 years old, brought to this country illegally by their parents, and they've been here and they've been productive members of society. You know, there needs to be a system to be able to um, at least grant a legal status mm -hmm to those individuals because they are productive members of society. Sure. And those types of individuals, need, we need to be able to work with, within the system to be able to say, okay, you go through these steps mm -hmm. and you will gain legal status. That doesn't mean that you will gain citizenship, right. mm -hmm. but you'll gain legal status. Sounds like you're saying, you're describing elements of an immigration bill. Yes. Like, and, and it sounds like you're all saying, we need an immigration bill of some kind. We, we, we've got, immigration laws on the books, but we're not enforcing them. Yeah. And so what we've got to have is an actual enforcement of what's going on. Let me ask you one more topic, uh, and that is the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been lots of debate about this. We now see with the federal government not taking step, uh, states individually taking it, some of them are practically doubling the minimum wage, uh, which seems a little bit astounding you know, to a reporter. Um, but we also have a lot of people in minimum wage jobs, for instance, let me tell you of a woman I know in Norcross who have for 18 years has worked for a condiment factory producing mayonnaise, mustard packets, and sugar packets. It's probably one of the largest corporations in Georgia to do that kind of work. Uh, a lot of their work actually goes to servicemen. Mm -hmm. She's worked there 18 years and her salary is, uh, and she only gets two weeks off, her entire salary is $20,000 a year. Mm -hmm. That's what she makes. Um, She's not a teenager, and twenty thousand dollars a year is barely above minimum wage, like fifty cents. Do we need to change the minimum wage? My take is is that you let the free market dictate what goes on, and any time that you have a government intervention, when government starts telling private enterprise what they may or may not do, I think you get into problems. By and large, those jobs that pay minimum wage are entry jobs. And so the goal of every individual that starts off at an entry level job where they're making minimum wage mm -hmm. or just slightly above, mm -hmm. then they need to have the goal in their own life, that self-initiative, to says, I, I want to get better. And so if, if we start moving towards mandating higher and higher and higher minimum wages, what's that, that one, one effect that that's gonna do, and we're already seeing it in California where they have raised it to $15 an hour, businesses are closing. All right, what's gonna happen to those individuals that did have a job? I bet it was at a minimum wage of, that, that was less than the $15, but now they're out of a job. So what did they do now? Well. Their, their motivation needs to be, I want to better myself, I want to get better training, I want to get a better education so that I can move up in life. That is the responsibility of every individual, not to rely on government to take care of them, but I am going to work myself to make sure that I can better my own self. And, and, and you know, I, I'm a prime example. I went and I got more and more education so that I could further myself. I started off at a, at a job working at a lumber yard many, many years ago, worked summer jobs at, at $4, less than $4 an hour. And, and, but I knew that that's not where I wanted to stay. 
I wanted to work to get a better job so that I could support my family. And that needs to be the goal and the initiative of every individual that lives in this country. We've been visiting with Roger uh, Fitzpatrick, a candidate for the uh, 9th Congressional District here in Northeast Georgia. And Roger, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you, sir. This is now Habersham. We're visiting this morning with Bernard Fontaine, a U.S. Congressional District candidate for District 9. Welcome, Bernie. Thank you, sir. Glad to have you with us. Let's start off with some easy questions. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your formal education that might prepare you for a seat in the, ha in the House. Yes, I'm glad you asked that question, as all the politicians would say. Uh, my education has been directly related to my time in the military and working through the government. Uh, I started off with a bachelor in business, and then I have got a master's in public administration. I'm now a doctoral candidate in political science. Uh, all of this was done in what I call Red Eye University at night <laughs> while serving militarily. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my uh, educational background. Okay, what about some informal things, your career, jobs you've had, activities you've participated in, things like that that might prepare you uh, as a congressman? Okay, my military background uh, was, was quite varied, but uh, I started out as a private and worked my way up and uh, retired through the Georgia National Guard as a Brigadier General. Uh, my background for the 20 years, the last 20 years of my uh, military career was as an engineer officer. And as such, I had to deal with military construction. I dealt with uh, anywhere from Sam Nunn's office to the state level in Atlanta. And after I retired, I took a job as a county manager, which was not the best job I ever had. <laughs> so I, I've been in every level of government and uh, probably my proudest moment <clears throat> is when I, uh, as an engineer officer, and I have concrete proof of this, saved four and a half million dollars on one project. Now, that's not because I am so brilliant, it's because there is so much fraud, waste, and abuse. And that is one of the areas that I certainly want to get involved in and do something about as an individual and as part of 434 others. Wow, that's impressive. Let me ask you a question uh, that sort of we're all talking about in the national campaign right now. And if you were elected to Congress, you would you would probably address it as well. Maybe it's certainly a big issue right now and has been in the presidential campaign. And that is the IRS. Personally, I'm interested in your answer if you were my congressman, because for several years I taught at a college campus that had six or seven different campuses and I was required to teach at three at any one moment. And so I had to travel during the day to all these campuses and accrued a lot of mileage and deducted that from my income tax, uh, as everybody can, uh, as an unreimbursed uh, employment compensation. Then I was told four years later I owed all that money back to the IRS to the tune of $14,000. <laughs> so I want to know, what do you think about the IRS? Should we abolish the IRS? Should there be changes in it? Should there be a flat tax? Should we increase the sales tax? Should we leave it like it is? Well, I, I find your background interesting because I, I was uh, 19 for college and I had several campuses to look after and I went through the same routine. So yes, I'm familiar with it. The short answer, the one that you hear most often from the average politician, and we have two of them in this race, is We'll abolish the IRS. Well, that, that's a quick and easy answer, but I have worked in government long enough that I know all the nuances that are involved in making it happen. Mm -hmm. Definitely, we need to get rid of the IRS as we know it. And uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I found recently that the IRS has more law enforcement officers than the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And, you know, it is it's just a horror story that needs to be addressed. It's being used for political purposes, obviously. It needs to be addressed. Uh, and I, for one, think that uh, obviously the fair tax sounds the best and is the best if we can manage to implement it. It's going to be a lot of problems in implementing it because the various states have, uh, you know, taxes that, that we can tag onto, some states don't, every state is different, 
Uh, there's a lot of problems involved. Uh, as a first step, I think we need to get rid of the loopholes, which that can be done fairly fast. The next step is possibly a flat tax with an intent to going to the fair tax, because a flat tax is better than what we have now. The fair tax would be obviously the ultimate to, you know, if we can implement it. I think it can be done over a period of time. Now, we've had since 1913 to mess this thing up. So <laughs> I think that we should take our time because I hate to see people be hurt by this. Mm -hmm. Like, given your situation you just described, you know, people are hurt by what the IRS does and doesn't do. And uh, we need to take it one step at a time and fix it. I have another question for another issue from you. It's also a big issue in this campaign, as you've, if you've listened to the presidential candidates and, and even the con congressional candidates, and that is immigration. Uh, in 2001, uh, the House, which you're running for, passed uh, the DREAM Act, which would help the children uh, who were brought here illegally by their parents. It would give those children, if they cert met certain uh, criteria, they weren't criminals, they had no felonies, they attended school and graduated or went on to college. They had a, a long list of things. And uh, it was also a short period that, that this could happen. It was passed by the House, it was defeated by the Senate. Eight years later, two or three years ago, it was flip-flop. The Senate passed it, the House rejected it. Uh, most people in America agree, at least the children of these uh, people who work in the chicken industry, the agriculture industry in Georgia, uh, need to have something done for them so they can get a driver's license and get a job and go to college. Even in Georgia, the top four universities forbid these people to come to their school. Uh, so my question is, as a congressman, how do you feel about at least the children of illegal immigrants and do we send everybody back or do we tr finally come up with an immigration bill that both parties agree it wishes to do? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, there's this myth about conservatives don't have a heart. And that, that is just that, a myth. It's, you know, we are interested in the children. We don't want the children to pay the price that uh, our employers caused, not the person that came in here illegally. Uh, and that is part of my problem is that I have worked in the construction industry and I've seen people give these hardworking people that come in here trying to support their family, they make them a quote contractor, even though they can't read English. And then of course they have a 1099 form so they don't take tax out on them. So they don't have to bother with that and they can make a better profit. And we the taxpayers are paying for this. These things need to be eliminated. The border needs to be closed. But in the meantime, I have no problem with children getting an education. As a matter of fact, I think it's an ideal situation for those children to get an education. And if they do go back to their country, uh, they will have seen that there is a better way. So yes, I, I support that, but within some limitations. Obviously, I don't want our children to be pushed out of college educations because of overzealous uh, liberals. You mentioned uh, re the, the myth that Republicans don't have a heart. I should point out here it was actually Republican uh, Senator Orrin Hatch right. from Utah who first sponsored this very first bill. Uh, and so that's a, to the point of your argument there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the minimum wage is a third issue maybe to talk about. Uh, as you know, California and some other states have already raised it, along with corporations, uh, to $15 an hour, which is more than double uh, what it is. Uh, here in Georgia, we have an awful lot. We don't, we don't just have teenagers in school or college students in school uh, holding minimum wage jobs uh, to, to support themselves or their education. We actually have a lot of uh, adults and parents and uh, mothers and fathers. The minimum wage right now is, gets us less than the poverty line in income if you work all year, 40 hours a week. Uh, should there be some change in the minimum wage? Should we do something to encourage corporations and businesses to increase the minimum wage on their own? What are your thoughts about that? Well, in a free market society, which we used to be, um, you know, the, the minimum wage would, would find its own level. and. Uh, I don't look to California. It used to be a bellwether state. I think right now it's the state you want to look at to avoid. Uh, so we, we, the, the problem, and you brought it out exactly, is that there aren't enough decent jobs for adults to go around, and that is the biggest part of the problem. 
I travel through the Ninth District and I find in every county there are empty factories. And it really bothers me that there are empty factories and that a few people make a lot of money by shipping everything out of the country ever since the North American Free Trade Agreement and those involved for it. I was teaching college classes then. I said then, I say now that making Oldsmobiles in Mexico doesn't help people in Detroit. Uh, we need to bring it back, get rid of that corporate income tax, which is ridiculous because it's just driven everybody out. Right now we have a lot of unemployed people, underemployed people, and those people are costing us the taxpayers, where if they had jobs here, they would be contributing. So it's what I call a double whammy. And therein lies the, the solution, I think. To go back to the, the minimum wage, I don't think that we should, uh, you know, change our ways just because a few people like to protest. I think we need to look at what are the results of this. Can the, can the market bear it? Do you want to pay $10 for a Big Mac? Okay. <laughs> you're, a vet you're a Vietnam veteran. That's correct. Uh, and you also risk your life in the service and the, uh, in the Army Corps? Yes, Army. Yes, I, I was an engineer. But, sure. Yeah. So how will uh, this congressional di district be better or be different with you in this position given what you've uh, given of yourself? Well, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to talk about, but... Uh, one of the reasons I'm running is because I'm a survivor. Uh, and I owe it to the rest of them. Uh, I don't want to talk about it because I can't. Mm -hmm. But we, we do obviously need to do something about national defense. And I'm asked, what would you do the first day you're in office? Well, I have an answer for them. I would write a letter to whoever the president is. And I don't dare to talk about that. But where the new president is, I would urge that new president to send a letter to those generals that were pushed out by Obama for trying to do what's right. Uh, get them back into the military and they will know what to do. I have no doubt that those that bent to the wishes and tried to do social experimentations within the government, and, and you've seen what's happened to our military, I, I hate to see it. Well, last weekend I was at the ranger camp, my old alma mater, and I asked a young captain, I said, you know, Captain, I said, I'm sure glad I'm not a captain putting up what you're putting up with right now. It would just break my heart. We've been visiting with Bernie Fontaine, the candidate for the 9th uh, District, 9th Congressional District here in Northeast Georgia. Bernie, good luck to you. Thank you, sir. All right. This is now Habersham, and this morning we're visiting with Mike Scooping. Correct a congressional candidate for the 9th Congressional District. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. To now Habersham. Great to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit about your formal education and so that the viewers will have a chance to know a little bit about you from that standpoint. Okay. Uh, I'm a graduate of Gainesville High School, uh, born there, uh, grew up there, married my high school sweetheart. Uh, my first degree is an associate's degree in architecture. Then I went on and got a BBA in economics at North Georgia College. And I also hold a Master of Science in Technology Management. Uh, background, I've been a land surveyor. Uh, I've owned gift stores. I have also had uh, uh, experience in building and developing and just, just done a, a wide array of things involving small business uh, virtually all my life. Let's talk about your experience, your informal experience or work experience, specifically how it might impact you as the uh, Congressional District Representative from, from District 9. What are some things you've done in, in your career or employment or, or other experiences that have prepared you for that? Well, you know, being a land surveyor, we got hit a lot of times with different regulations that the uh, government a lot of puts on the state and the state passes on to us. Uh, all of a sudden, we became supposed to be experts on floodplains, which is really not uh, a land surveying uh, arena, but yet we were forced into it by regulations that uh, they put on the banks, which they transferred to us. Uh, also, in uh, building and developing, uh, we're watching tremendous regulations that are coming down, and uh, some of them are good, but an awful lot of them are really not needed. And I think that's one of the, the, the big issues for me when it comes to, to what I see taking place in Congress is Congress tends to pass uh, generic, I call them generic laws, 
and then they give them to the bureaucrats to really make up the real laws. So what we have really is we no longer have a representative form of government. We have bureaucrats that are really making our laws in, instead of our legislators. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about an issue. Uh, recently, I visited my son up in the Northeast. Uh, he gets, well, not this year, he's had relatively no snow, but last uh, two years, he's had six feet of snow at one time on the ground. But he also has, for two years, had solar uh, panels on his roof that he worked out with the power company in upstate New York. Uh, he's made enough uh, electricity from just the solar panels on just his roof to have no electric bill or power bill for the entire year. In fact, he gets back on the average about $70, $80 a month in cash. The local power system in, in that area has encouraged this with local residents. So I got interested in it. And uh, when I called um, my power company, which is HEMC, uh, they said, well, we have a new program for you that might work. You can purchase or lease a power, a solar panel elsewhere, not on your property, but elsewhere. And then it's a small fee. And then whatever you generate, we will deduct that fee plus whatever more you generate from your monthly bill, which I think is a, a great step in that sort of same direction. It's not quite as good as owning your own panels. When I talked to the other power company, there seemed to be the major one in our state, there seemed to be not a whole lot of interest in me developing my own uh, solar power and selling it back to them. I, I live in a house that on the right side of my house my neighbors are HGMC and on the other side of my house are the other, is the other larger power company. So uh, as a congressional candidate uh, we have the opportunity here in the Sun Belt to generate a lot of electricity uh, on our property with solar power. What is your stand on that? What do you think about that? Would you support uh, maybe encouraging the major power company in the state to do something about that. Yes, I would instead of building multi-billion dollar power plants. Yes, I would support that kind of a concept in the state. Uh, I don't see anything in the Constitution that gives the federal government any authority really over that area. So that should be, <clears throat> excuse me, a state issue. And that goes back to what kind of a public service commission we have. And currently, we do not have a public service commission that is really pushing for the people. They are representing the establishment. They are representing the power companies against the people. And I understand there are some good people running uh, against some of these incumbents. And I really think that the people need to look at changing who our PSC is because that's where this has to change because you should have the right as a citizen to go off the power grid if you have the availability and the ability to do so. Sounds good. It also seems to be a way to avoid spending the kind of money we're talking about for two more power plants right. in Georgia. It would be. If we could all be generating electricity and helping out the situation. It would be. All right. Let's go to another issue, immigration. So let me explain to you quickly. I've raised a, a godson from age 12 to now 22. He's a senior at uh, Texas Christian University. He uh, has no uh, documentation other than he is covered by President Obama's Deferred Action, which is an amnesty. It's a two-year program where you can get a driver's license uh, if you're not a criminal and you don't have a criminal record, and you can get a Social Security card, and so you can also work uh, uh, legally. And you can also attend colleges and university. But the state of Georgia made that difficult. Uh, what the state of Georgia did said these kids who have, like my son has a 4.0 GPA, uh, these kids cannot go to our four top universities here in Georgia, uh, even if they're qualified and even if their parents have paid taxes uh, and have proof of those taxes, in fact. So what do you think about the immigration situation in Georgia? And I know the immediate answer we almost hear from everybody is we won't address that until we build a wall or until we stop the flow. The fact is we have people here now and we have Republicans and we have Democrats who both agree at different times that there needs to be a way to solve this problem, particularly in our state. What are your thoughts about that? Well, first off, if we begin to address those kinds of issues before we address the real problem, we've lost a lot of leverage. So I think the problem has got to be addressed first before you start addressing these backup issues. And when you see a situation like that, I equate it to, uh, suppose that I fall on hard times and uh, I'm having a hard time feeding my family. And so my family's starving to death. So I go to the bank or I come to your house and I rob you. Now I've broken the law. Now, because my family is starving, are you going to forgive me and say, well, we don't want to do anything. You're really a good guy, 
So let's just just kind of go along, and we'll just kind of let you skate, and 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 for, we're just going to forgive this. I don't believe that's the right thing to do. When you break laws, there are consequences that come with breaking laws, and we know that. And when someone comes here under some situation that is not uh, uh, legal, then I think there are consequences that have to be paid. We're taught that in Scripture, mm-hmm. you know, that you know, God teaches us the ways we should go. And he also shows us that when we depart from those ways, we're free to do so, but there are consequences that have to be paid. So we've got to address the main problem first before we even go there. Yeah. The, um, two years ago, the legislature made it clear, and I know you're running for Congress, but you would be representing us as well, made it clear that, um, that any illegals, uh, aliens, undocumented citizens in Georgia who were discovered in a car stop or if I were taking them to school or to a hospital or to work, that I too might be arrested for aiding them. Uh, when that happened, the, uh, the migrant workers who come from Florida to Georgia to North Carolina, South Carolina, did not come that year. This was two years ago. And the Vidalia onions and the peanuts rotted in the ground. They brought out the prisoners who did it one day and said, we're not going back. So there does seem to be a problem here now right the second that needs to be solved in terms of creating uh, immigration papers for migrant workers, people here to help you and I eat and have food. Uh, so we seem to be making no progress on that. Yeah, I have no problem with bringing people in if we really need them. Um, but I think we've got to be very careful about that program because what has happened under that program is companies like Disney are using it to eliminate people that need higher paying jobs. And so there's, there's, uh, there's some real consequences that come with it. So that program needs to be tweaked. Uh, I have no problem with bringing in workers that are truly needed, but we can't leave that thing open so that every company can do it just simply because they can hire people cheaper. Mm-hmm. Good point. So let me ask you this. Not everybody knows you, Mike, uh, since you're not incumbent. Let's take a minute to talk about you, your um, activities you're in, organizations you're a part of, volunteer you've done, how you spend your time uh, so people might get to know you a little bit better. Well, I uh, became retired in 2008, not out of a voluntary retirement, but because of the economy. At that point, I was in the developing and building business, and it just virtually stopped. And in 2009, the Tea Party movement began, and I was very intrigued with that. Uh, Tried to find a Tea Party in my area to get involved with. There was nothing. So uh, uh, I had a little party in my home and invited about 12 couples. Uh, We showed a video, uh, and then when it was over, I said, how many want to join? Nobody. (laughs) Everybody, the, the whole time, they wanted to fuss about what was going on but they didn't want to get involved. So at that point, you know, that was a little discouraging for me. So, you know, the, a lot of people, I guess, would just give up and say, well, there's nothing to be done. But instead, I continued trying to find people that uh, thought like I did. And it took me about a, a year and two or three months. And during that year, I literally operated as a one-man tea party. I was going around doing things, going to conferences, uh, Went to D.C., went to Arizona, uh, a lot of different things like that where I was learning about what was going on in our nation and what we could do about it. Uh, In 2010 in D.C. um, at a conference, they put forth a call for people to uh, push something through the state legislatures called the Health Care Compact Agreement. And uh, I looked around, and I was the only one I knew there from Georgia, and I knew if I didn't volunteer, it it wasn't going to happen in Georgia, so I volunteered to do that. Got back home and quickly forgot about my volunteering. And the second week in January, I got a phone call. Can you be in Houston, Texas for training on how to push the health care compact agreement through your legislature? So I flew out to Texas, went through the training. While I was there, I met two great people, um, uh, Ed Painter and Linda Fowler from over in the Dalton area. And when we got back to Georgia in 2011, we started pushing the health care compact agreement uh, at our state legislature. None of us had ever done anything like that before. Georgia was the first state in the nation to get it signed by the governor. And what that basically does, it would eliminate Obamacare in any state that signs on to that compact agreement. It also block granted Medicaid and Medicare benefits back to the state, so it put the state in charge instead of the federal government. Uh, 
All of that to say, I am the founder of Lanier Tea Party Patriots. Uh, we have grown from its inception of basically one person, which was me for over a year, to right at 500 people now. And we meet on the third Thursday uh, of every month at uh, Gainesville Civic Center. We are a very active uh, Tea Party. We have been on uh, Congressman Collins's case now for quite some time about his voting record and when he just refuses to move away from voting with the establishment. Uh, that's one of the main reasons that I have stepped up to run is because I have been watching his record. This is the problem we have in America right now. Uh, we have congressmen like Doug Collins that go up there. They vote with the progressives. They vote with Boehner and they come back and tell us how conservative they are and they give us all this wonderful, glowing reports of what they're doing. He sends back YouTube videos where he's just grilling the, the bureaucrats up there. And we cheer him on when he does something like that. And But then we don't really look and see how he's voting. Uh, there are two things that should tell us an awful lot about our sitting congressman. Those are he's sitting now on the Judiciary Committee and the House Rules Committee, the two most powerful and oldest committees in Congress. You do not get placed on those committees by leadership unless you are willing to do what leadership asks you to do. So what we have now, we have a sitting congressman from the most conservative district east of the Mississippi River that is really kowtowing to the progressive leadership in Congress. And if that's what the people want, then they need to send him back up there because uh, obviously they like what's coming out of Washington if they put him back. This old adage that, oh, everybody's congressman is bad, but ours does not hold true with Doug Collins. He is a pure rhino. We've been visiting with Mike Scapine, a, con a candidate for the 9th Congressional District. Good luck, Mike. Thank you. We hope you've benefited from these interviews sponsored by Now Habersham. And we want to remind you, be sure to vote May 24th.